I would really like to thank all of you for coming out, and I would especially like to thank the Office of Sustainability, the Sustainability, Equity and Justice Fund, the Salish Sea Institute, Redfish School of Change, Huxley College of the Environment, Stefan, Natalie, Lydia, Nick, Joy, Kona, Chris, uh, Ashley, Sarah, Ginny, Liz, have I, have I missed anyone else? All of you. Um, for coming out, and I, one of the things I was teasing Nick about is that I am a lucky person in that I, I often get to come to wonderful places. But I have to say, the way in which this two-day workshop has been organized and facilitated is just really outstanding. So the fact that I had the pleasure of meeting this morning with environmental education students who helped us craft the kinds of affinity groups we'll be talking about uh, at the Sky Bridge and was able to meet with people in the sustainability class and to do uh, work with faculty and staff at lunchtime and then be here with you now and then have a, a seminar again tomorrow. Um, it's a wonderful thing and it takes so much work. So thank you all for your work in making that happen and your work in getting here today. I really appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to jump right in with my dog. <laughs> so what I would love you to do is to, without talking to your neighbor, take a look at one of those cards. Don't tell anybody which card you're picking, but just really look at that card and make it your card, okay? Now, look into Cookie Dough's eyes, <laughs> okay? Look really tightly. And Cookie Dough, even when she's not physically here and she only weighs eight pounds, is capable of making your card disappear. I say she made your card disappear. How many people's cards disappeared? Hands up. That's phenomenal. That's a chihuahua that's not even here, right? That's incredible. OK, my work is done. No. So the reason I invited Cookie Dough to help me with that, and she's actually standing on a table, she's that small, um, is because of this question in my mind about the power of expectation and belief, right? When you look at that, we, we believe our card was there, right? And that we took away one of those cards. Does anyone know the secret to that trick? Aha, some people know the secret to the trick. Shall I tell you? I think it's against the magician's rules. Otis, how did it work? Um, you, flip the card over. you could flip the card over. Well, the real secret of it is that all of the cards changed, right? But because you believed I was just taking one card away, you didn't see that probably, <laughs> right? Or you can believe in the magic of a chihuahua, which I also believe in. So it shows you the power of what we expect. And I think when we think about hope, uh, if we think in hopeful ways, we manifest hope. If we think in hopeless ways, we manifest hopelessness. And, and I thought Cookie was a good way to think about that. Um, we're in this incredible time of of conservation innovation, a lot of digital work being done in conservation biology that allows scientists to track animals and tell us what matters to them. So this great white shark is wearing a digital satellite tag, which the researcher studying it can follow on her cell phone and then help us see maps of the ocean that tell us what parts of that ocean really matter to particular species and therefore which areas we really need to be thinking about protecting. We're in this whole digital conservation time. What's been intriguing about that to me is, is what starts to happen when areas are, are coming back. And I had the pleasure of living in Monterey, California for 18 years. And Monterey Bay is undergoing a tremendous recovery right now. And one of the things happening is this great increase of sharks, great white sharks going close to shore in Monterey Bay. And at the same time, a real increase in the population of people spending time in the ocean. Okay, surfing, swimming, scuba diving. And what's been intriguing about that is what do you think would happen? What's your expectation? More sharks, more people. More encounters. More encounters. That's a beautiful sentence. More encounters, <laughs> right, with white sharks, right? Yeah, there are more encounters with white sharks. But surprisingly, the likelihood of being bitten has dropped tremendously. Okay, now why is that? More sharks, more people, you might expect that it would go up. Well, it's because of things like the Endangered Species Act and the Marine, Protected, uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act have borne out and there are more elephant seals, more harbor seals, more California sea lions, more things that white sharks like to eat. So at the same time as more people are in the water, more of their prey species are in the water. 
I had the pleasure of doing some work with the Mind Body Lab at Stanford University. And one of the uh, studies that they do there is they are looking at how object, sorry, subjective beliefs, like what we feel and think will happen, believe will happen, affect objective reality. So in this particular study, they were working with people who clean hotel rooms. And what they discovered is people who clean hotel rooms in this particular sample were quite concerned that they were not very fit because they didn't have, have time to exercise because they're working so hard. Um, the only intervention they did was with one group, they just heard them talk about that. With the other group, they showed them how working in a hotel room is a lot like working out in a, in a gym. If you're lifting something heavy or you're moving an object around or you're bending over. And that simple, simple intervention, no changing of diet, no changing of exercise, just a different conception of work, produced different results. A drop in weight, a drop in blood pressure. So, you know, what we see, feel, and believe has a big impact on what happens. So what happens when these are the images that we see about the environment? And I just ask you at this moment to just think about how, how do you feel when you see those kinds of images? Right? It's an important question. It isn't a frilly or frou-frou question. Because if what we feel and believe impacts how we enact the world around us, then it becomes incredibly powerful. And part of this question is, what is the collateral damage of all of that doom and gloom? Well, one way of doing that is trying to look at people who are giving words to try and describe the kinds of feelings that we have around the environment. And if you notice these terms, um, apathy, grief, despair, fatigue, they are, they are powerful words that talk about how, how destructive that gloom and doom narrative can be. Uh, increasing interest in terms of people choosing not to have children because of fears about the state of the planet in terms of the environment. Other people are tracking hopelessness among scientists. Um, and I think what's interesting there, I've been lucky enough to be working with the Environmental Studies Program at UVic, and the whole question of students who go through an environmental program and then have to take time out from it in order to recover in order to move on into that profession. That's a real issue that needs to, needs to be looked at. And it's not just environmental studies, it's in other fields too where this phenomenon is occurring. Add on to that that we are living in a period of global cynicism and pessimism. Who relates to this? Yeah. And um, fascinating work on who do we trust. On top of all of this, the dominant ways in which we find out about the environment are either through, in, in the academic setting, through journal articles or through mainstream media. And when we hear about the environment, the International um, Environmental Journalism Association has numbers for how dominant an, a, pro, a problem orientation for media is. At the same time, journals also are heavily, heavily weighted in their abstracts of publishing problem identification instead of solutions orientation. And I often think that's so fascinating because in medical journals, that's not the case, right? How many medical journals did we open up and, oh, everyone's dead. <laughs> you know, we, I mean, of course, we're all going to die, sorry. But, um, you know, we don't think of it in the same way. And I think, I think we need to think of it in the same way. The, again, the reason I think this is so important is that work coming from psychology talks about self-fulfilling prophecies. Right? So if we are hopeful, we tend to look for more hopeful things. That reiterates our sense that things are hopeful. We then proceed to engage in things that are hopeful, and we create more hopeful things. The same pattern, though, is true of hopelessness. Um, again, hopelessness, worry, and cynicism, when we look again in the psychological literature, where does it head us to? It heads us to apathy. And I don't know how many of you feel sometimes you just shut down or tune out or turn off. Is that a familiar experience? Yeah. It's a self-protective experience, which is leading to these sorts of questions. Yeah. Is environmental grief actually part of what's disengaging us? And um, 
some very interesting work there talking about how is the media actually constructing disengagement. Right? All of this to say that emotions matter. They matter a lot. And I've, over the course of today, I've had so many interesting discussions that I'm really eager to continue afterwards around this feeling of despair and weightiness and hopelessness and the scale of problems is, is so overwhelmingly present, we almost don't have a way of talking about it at all. So it's one of these things that we don't talk about even though we're experiencing it and trying to deal with it. And that's why I think this lecture and the work that comes out of it is so valuable. Um, so how do we engender hope? I always put up this, my dear friend Lucinda. Lucinda is a fox. She really is a fox in this picture. She's a fox. And um, because I really love Otis and people like Otis of that age, I, one of the things I could do when I first started thinking about hope and despair was I thought, I am going to write a children's book about hope that is only based on scientific examples of, of solutions. And I wrote not your typical book about the environment. And it got that crazy title because it was very hard, even though I've published a lot of books, very hard to get this book published because the publishers who I sent it to said, if it's an environmental book, it can't be hopeful. So I thought, oh, there's a problem. So that's how it became that. Also, a lot of research for us to draw on now. Before, when we talked about hope, there wasn't that much to look at. Now, look at what's happening in terms of the publishing literature around emotions and decision making and how important they are to us. Increasing interest in things like pride and how does pride motivate us rather than uh, doom and gloom. And so when we look across the psychological literature about engagement, the things that start coming up as being quite powerful precursors to engagement are things like empathy and relationship and meaningful purpose. And fear and shame don't stack up with well. Now I think what's intriguing about this is fear and shame can work really well if you're trying to create a large corporation to take a different action. But on a personal basis, they're quite demotivating. And so again, the politics of how you use them is important. Fear and shame have also worked well for small interventions, like trying to get you to put on a seatbelt, right? That's not the same as dealing with a complex environmental issue like climate change. And so I think we want to really move beyond that fear and shame motivation. And another area that I think holds a lot of promise for us is in the question of genes. So we're often talking about, you know, people are just naturally selfish. We'll never get through the state of the planet because people are selfish. Well, there's been very interesting work coming out of the uh, Center for Compassion and Altruism Studies at Stanford University. And they make a distinction between uh, hedonic approaches to well-being. So those are things that you do that make you just feel great. Like this person obviously feels great eating chocolate, right? <laughs> I feel like that when I see chocolate and eat chocolate. Um, that's good. You feel better when you do that thing. You've got a positive psychological feeling. But what's been intriguing in their work is that when you do something on behalf of others, a eudaimonic approach, and this is just a great example of, of here in this area, you know, there's this great app that if you happen to find a, a big piece of, of styrofoam blown up onto the beach, you can, you can send it into the app and they'll get it removed and, and move it around, you know? So you can be part of making this uh, shoreline even healthier. When you do that, you not only feel just as good as when you eat chocolate, but actually you, you benefit on a biological level. And they've been able to show a, a decrease in inflammation and an increase in immunity when you act on behalf of others, which is really intriguing. So they would say we're hardwired for compassion, which changes how you might think about what other people's motivation is. One of the key ideas, if, if you take away nothing else from our time together, is I really think this is essential. This idea that stories change and that when we're talking about environmental problems, we have a real tendency to think in terms of like big slogans. The ocean is broken, like that headline, right? And when we do that, we miss changes that are occurring that are important to keep track of. And so I'll just share a couple here.
And the sea otter one I think is so intriguing to me because when you think about the capacity of other species and their resilience and relationship with the environment, um, uh, Andy Johnson, who is my f former husband, he worked a lot on reintroducing sea otters in Monterey Bay. And when they really recognized that when sea otters had been injured and they were being reintroduced, that if they put them into a slough, which is a wetland area, it was a little bit quieter. It was a space that sea otters were spending time in naturally. Um, and they knew very well, as many of you will know, that sea otters are really great at recovering kelp forests, right? What they didn't know at the time is sea otters are really great at recovering wetlands. <laughs> and so when you put a bunch of sea otters into an eelgrass bed, in fact, the eelgrass beds were recovered in the same kind of way. So I think this capacity of restoration that we may not even be aware of, you know, we assign kelp forests to sea otters and don't even think of them in terms of eelgrass beds, that, that is really sitting there. And now the next stage of that project is to look at what happens when they return sea otters uh, into areas like San Francisco Bay. And I'm happy to report that San Francisco Bay is recovering so much that that's a real project that they're looking at right now. On my way here today, I saw hundreds of these. How many of you have seen one of these? Yeah, isn't that, I mean, I just find that phenomenal, right? Not the case, not that long ago. So again, these generalized slogans, they are really uh, sort of the opposite of hope. Generalized slogans, as soon as you apply them, everything becomes hopeless. So I really am an advocate for looking at emerging trends and thinking a lot about specific examples, like Monterey Bay. Why is Monterey Bay recovering and what do we learn from it that affects other recovering areas? What can work? And I think in part and parcel with that, one of the real trends that's happening is this whole age of engagement. You know, and, and you know that well yourself, like if you're watching Netflix or something like that, we, we really expect now to be able to personalize that and have it personalized for us. And that the idea of just being told to do something just doesn't fit anymore. We really expect to co-create the things that we're part of. And I've had the pleasure of, of looking at Stanford at some of these emerging trends that are happening with millennials and generation uh, Z, Z, people that are many of us here today. And, and the trends that are happening in that area around the expectation of co-creation and around the expectation of this matters to me right now and this is how I want to act is really powerful. It's really powerful and different than one big message being blown at everybody. Okay? Um, we're even seeing this a lot, I think, fascinatingly in art. And this is the work of an artist, Jeremy Deller, who um, you might know there was a major anniversary of the Battle of the Somme, one of the horrible World War I battles. And the idea of Jeremy Deller was that he would put thousands of people of exactly that age just suddenly in uniform of the time into public spaces in London. And they would just be there. And they would have a card that showed a name and you could go to a hashtag and see what was happening. And the power of, in what Jeremy Diller's doing there, and many artists do this, and I know Nick, in fact, was involved in a reenactment project. Um, what he's doing there is saying, it isn't us and the public. It's a co-creation of, if this is a memorial, a memorial isn't just a stand-up place. It's a lived feeling. It's an emotional reaction. And how do we do that? And in order to do this work, he also had to co-create with um, people in the uh, British theater scene in order to talk about how do you prepare people who are in that role. But I think it's very interesting, this idea that we are not in this general broadcasting anymore, but more in the co-creation of solutions. And we see that in sustainable seafood very powerfully. So I don't know how many of you have ever been to a hackathon. Have you? Yeah, some of you have. Have you ever been to a fish hackathon? Yeah, I know, it's so cool. So in a fish hackathon, they're doing the same thing. They're looking at what are these fisheries issues that might be solved through certain coding or other technological ways. And, um, and what's been fascinating to me is watching the increase in number of people involved in fish hackathons and how much fishers using their cell phones are, are tying it into a sustainable seafood market and response, responsibly, very quickly, in a way that wasn't possible before. So here we have you know, an incredible thing. 15 years ago, the amount of sustainable seafood was, you, you could not, in fact, track it. 
because it wasn't present enough. And now we have this very high billions. And I was happy to see this update of, of look at the direction that that's going. And that all came about because the technique of sustainable seafood has been looking at where do most people eat seafood in the United States, for example, is in restaurants. And so if you really want to impact sustainable seafood, you got to be talking with chefs and people eating in restaurants. And that's why they created an app that allowed you to see very easily what are sustainable choices. And I'll tell you that um, in the case of Seafood Watch, it changes every three months. Changes every three months because if it's really effective, those, those fishing practices are shifting and they want to make sure that people are rewarded for shifting in a positive direction. So I think it's the end of the public. I think we're now collections of, of multiple identities. And just a quick example of that, um, looking at sea turtle conservation, a fellow named Hoyt Peckham, who's been very interested in loggerhead turtle uh, problems, he, he was invited to a situation where there was a lot of dead sea turtles in the beach off the coast of Mexico. And when he came upon this, he quickly, through conversations with local community members, discovered that what is an endangered species known uh, you know, with major turtle extruder devices and all of these high cost things, it turns out that they are so plentiful in that one area that the local fishers there see them as a nuisance animal. They're constantly getting into the nets. And what he was able to do by working very closely with just a few community fishers was to realize that those turtles have a very long adolescence over a decade long and they spend all of that adolescence in one really small place and so if they really wanted to impact sea turtle survivorship investing in individual people might be the exact way to do that to good effect and Hoyt Peckham has gone on to create a conservation organization there he's still very actively involved I think one of the other things we're seeing in this end of the public is whose voice and so when we see a consistent headline in The Guardian, The New York Times, CNN, and Vox um, that's saying the same thing. We understand that because that's an urgent issue and, and the impulse is to you know, get the word out. This is a catastrophe. This is a big problem. And it's kind of predicated on this idea that if people just knew better, they would act better, right? That's the assumption that goes on under that thing. But the question is, what if they do know better? What if they already know better? So in the case of climate change, we see from the World Economic Forum, it's a very high level of awareness and high level of concern among, excuse me, amongst millennials and Generation Z, Z people around that issue. And that's led to some very interesting statements by people like Dan Cahan, who says he does a lot of work on something called cultural cognition. And in cultural cognition, it says, I, if I self-identify in a particular way, if you present me with an issue like climate change, I'm really looking to see what the people I identify with think about that. And if, if they don't think about it in the way that you're telling me, the drive for my identity is stronger than the drive for this. And so it moves away from this idea of a trusted source that is somehow an external wise scientist perhaps, although that's extremely important, and moves it into the idea that, that really communication is about people I identify with doing something that makes sense to me and then I'm going to do that. So the broadening and diversification of environmental engagement I think has been really fascinating to watch. Um, I love this. I happened to be in Denmark and this was an award-winning campaign promoting cycling for the elderly. So we see now, of course, divers. How many of you are interested in surf rider? Right, surfing groups, yep, Yahoo. You know, we see um, weddings and special celebrations and the impact of making different choices around that. A very innovative couple in Vancouver started a campaign where they offered a free honeymoon to any of their friends who decided to not have shark fin soup at their wedding. And that turned into quite a contagious and replicated thing. Right now, for some reason, I'm massively interested in urban birding. And uh, the reason for that, I think, is because it brings together a lot of these things. That One of the things I would say in the Anthropocene, this idea that we live in a time where um, the planet is very much impacted by us as a species, humans as a species, and we know that we're rapidly urbanizing, that where nature is found and, and how we relate to it is really shifting around. And so in urban birding, um, 
we find situations where people in that movement, and I'll tell you, it's a, it's a global movement, are choosing to show birds in these kinds of contexts, right? Not zooming in and showing you the bird and hiding all of that, but saying, no, birds live in these cities. I live in this city. These places matter. And I see urban birding as quite a powerful way of, of positioning urban and wild in a way that I haven't seen in other groups. I find it really intriguing. In the same way, um, sometimes social scientists will give uh, cameras to uh, people and say to them, show me places that matter to you. Show me what uh, areas we should be, that are meaningful to you, you know, in a way to get a sense of our connection to the environment. And recently, uh, one of my graduate students did an interesting study with newcomers in the city of Toronto, asking this very same question. And what came up there were things like this, a sense of belongingness, right? So if, we, if we're diversifying how we're thinking about the environment and whose voice matters, we get very different messages. Um, lots of work with teens, yeah, and very young people. There's a whole movement of microactivists. I don't know if you know them, they're seven and under. Yeah, I know, I don't know. And, and this work, I was lucky enough to do a project with the Monterey Bay Aquarium where we were creating a social media um, engagement strategy. And what was really important to us is that it be by teens for teens. And so most of my work was in, I, we had the idea that if it was really co-created, the students should change and the institution should change, right, as a result of that project. And that was really interesting to watch how that happened. And one of the things that really happened was teens were extremely aware that social media is social, right? You don't just flood it with environmental problems. <laughs> uh, they were working on the Proposition uh, 90, oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting. As do you remember, 95? It was the plastic bag ban in the state of California. And 94, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, in their efforts in their social media, they very rarely made an ask around that campaign. That, their work was a lot on funny fish pictures and bad dad jokes and all of those kinds of things. But when they did make those asks, they were quite powerfully listened to. So learning from each other. I want to touch on a few other emerging trends that I, I really want to, I think I find hope in. One is this idea of bye-bye plastic. Um, we are witnessing the global demise of the plastic bag. Single-use plastic bag. Yeah, I think we should be happy about that. Even, <laughs> even the Guardian newspaper is talking in terms of, you know, what is going on here with this incredible response to plastic? And so we see, you know, individual cities moving forward. And look what's happened here. Billingham, an early adopter, and then your county moving forward. Uh, Victoria. Even the Queen, the reason I pulled this out is because right now I live in Victoria and I sent this to the Mayor of Victoria because there's a very strong interest in what the British do <laughs> in Victoria. And she was able to use this with City Council to say, look, even the Queen's doing this. Um, we see uh, single use being a word of the year. How fascinating, right? Shows you how prevalent that is. We see movement from plastic bags into other areas. Again, we see artists. I really like to watch what artists are doing. Look at this artist installation of soccer balls found in the ocean, but using them as a way to think about our position in the, in the universe. And Adidas, I don't know if you know, they came out with a shoe that's made entirely from ocean plastic, but what I kind of admired is they didn't tell us that till after they'd sold a million pairs of them. And that's me wearing my glasses that are made out of uh, waste from fishing nets. Hello, marine protected areas. Um, so I had the pleasure of writing the scientific brief to try and convince this person to create the world's largest marine protected area back in 2009 and uh, 2008. And uh, I'm happy to say it was successful. Um, not just me, <laughs> many people worked on that. Um, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> But what I find really telling about that was it was in the Marianas Trench, the deepest ocean canyon in the world. At the time, it was a large ecosystem scale marine protected area, and it was the largest, 2009. So 10 years later, I don't even know how much. I think it's down to being maybe the 12th largest. So we're in this huge period of marine protected area establishment. And what's important about that is that's happening 
ecosystem scaled marine protected areas and work being done on what happens to the fish biomass in those protected areas, right? So these are not small individual, wouldn't it be nice, but what are you really talking about? These are globally scaled trends that are having a big impact. At the same time, there's a real interest in solutions. I think that we're seeing a shift in journalism. So there are now major journalism schools that offer not only courses, but small schools of solutions journalism. And the idea in solutions journalism is that Yes, you still talk about an issue, but you move one step farther and look at what solutions are being enacted and, and rigorously look at them. How effective are they? Were they reproduced? What are, they, what are the outcomes? You use the same diligent strategy of the journal, journalists to look at solutions. And one of the things that that pushes is looking at change over time, which again is a really important part of all of this. There's even something called hope punk. How many of you have been following this literature? Anyone? You look it up. I mean, who knew? Um, my own engagement directly with this question was in recognizing the narrative of doom and gloom. I kept coming into the situation where I would interview people wherever I could and ask them to give me examples of hope that were scientifically based. And every time I did that, people could give me examples. But I couldn't find a repository for those examples. There wasn't one place I could go to find them. And so, uh, as luck would have it, I happened to meet a person who was very, very active in digital philanthropy. And he said, you know, you should really think about how to crowdsource hope. And we didn't really know how to do that. How would you crowdsource ocean solutions that are hopeful? And so a couple of people, the people in that picture, we got together for one weekend in a little tiny place in England and one of the ideas we had is that we would create this hashtag. And that hashtag did indeed go viral. And becomes, for me, it's funny when people say, how do you find hope? I find hope by looking not only at that hashtag, but other hashtags that have emerged out of there that are similarly crowdsourcing examples of solutions that exist. And one of the things I'm actively doing now is using those as a data set to look at what solutions actually exist within that data set. So not just how do we feel when we read about them, but what are important trends in conservation. And if any of you are big data people or data visualizers, I could really use your help and I would love to talk to you more about that. So crowdsourcing optimism. I think we were lucky because right at the same time we were launching that Twitter tag, uh, these kinds of ideas were coming forward. The idea that by manipulating Facebook accounts, 750,000 of them, researchers were able to figure out that uh, not only is hope contagious, literally contagious, if I'm hopeful, you're much more likely to feel that way. You'll catch hope from me and me from you, but it's also contagious online. Um, a very important part of all of this for me is that there are other species on Earth. There are 8.9 million other species, that's what we think right now, and that they too are very actively changing and engaged in the world. So one of the phenomenon that I'm noticing right now is this increase of resident whales. So as whale populations, many, many, many whale populations have increased since the end of whaling. And as that's been happening, we're starting to see um, resident whales. So our idea that large baleen whales are all migratory, right? How many of you grew up with that idea? Yeah, the thought is now that they probably weren't always all migratory. They just needed to be migratory because of the circumstances in which we were seeing them. And in fact, resident whales that stay in one place because they can is becoming much more noticeable. Uh, we see cases of animals like this where we see transgenerational resilience so that if a parent of this fish is raised in water that's higher temperature and higher CO2, as is the case with climate change, then in fact, the baby fish is better able to function in those environments. And the importance of that work is not to say that it doesn't matter if there's climate change because fish can adapt. It's to say that perhaps buys a little bit of time as we work even harder on ameliorating climate change issues. So again, we see reef building algae. We see some studies in these areas. We see um, zebra finches and uh, in this particular case, what unbelievable as it sounds, scientists have found that zebra finches actually make a call when temperatures are super hot, like in a drought condition. And the sound of that call 
to the unhatched chick still inside the egg influences the development of that chick so that when it hatches, those chicks go on to make nests that are better capable of dealing with high heat and they have a slightly different body form that makes them better functioning in high heat. I know that sounds impossible. I interviewed the woman, she's a very, very science person. <laughs> and um, I still can't quite grasp the incredibleness of that. Once again. Just want to touch for a moment on this idea of embracing ambiguity. I mentioned that in terms of urban birding. Um, this place is so meaningful to me in the sense of, as may my daughter always last, because I always say it's broken and it's beautiful. So this is Bikini Atoll that you will know as Bikini Atoll, the place where more nuclear bombs were tested than any other place. And so we have 85% coral recovery. People go scuba diving there now. And yet, there's still high areas of radiation in some parts and not in other parts. So how do we handle these broken but beautiful places? Where do they fit in our ideas of hope? Um, Chernobyl, some of you may have seen a wonderful film called Radioactive Wolves. Uh, Chernobyl is, in fact, the best uh, conservation breeding success place in all of Europe for wolves. And they're radioactive, and they are the best breeding wolves. So we have to get comfortable with this. This is another example where manatees are actually using the warm water from a coal-powered plant in the winter, right? And uh, so these, these adjustments create all kinds of feelings for us. Is this terrible? Is this impressive resilience? What's going on there? And ambiguity is something I know people wanted to talk about later on in the session. I just wanted to finally talk about this challenging the human and nature divide. So. Uh, one of the books that's over there is called Watching Giants, and I wrote that book because of this real emergence of culture, recognizing culture that exists in other species, and, and then work done by Hal Whitehead that shows not only do we have cultures in other species, but that culture has gone on to, in fact, um, drive evolution, right? So we have this evolutionary change, which is something up until this point we thought was strictly human. And fascinating to me, the UN recognizing culture as an important thing for other species. We see chimp tool use. These are, these are archaeological finds of tools, but they belong to chimps who used them 4,300 years ago. Right? Archaeology. Uh, I did a wonderful article, wonderful in the sense of my enjoyment of writing it, uh, around this idea of ephemeral tools. So we know sea otters use tools like crazy, but they're ephemeral. So how do archaeologists study that? Um, the power of compassion in other species. In this particular case, some of the students will have read a paper or an article that I wrote around this very interesting phenomenon that when uh, transient killer whales, so those are the uh, seal and sea lion eating killer whales, when they are actively hunting something and they're noisy, there's been over 180 cases of humpback whales hurrying over and actually messing with the killer whales who may be going after a fish or a seal or a sea lion or other um, marine mammals. You know, I, so what's going on there? Is that compassion? Is that altruism? What is happening there? So provocative questions coming forward. Uh, scientists looking at optimism in starlings and hope in bees. Fish have feelings. Uh, a whole study of work there and interestingly that this idea that when you look in the mirror, if you can see that it's you you're looking at, that's been used as a mirror self-recognition, has been used as a marker of intelligence. So in recent years, people have known that there's, that's so funny, I can see that it's saying something. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank um, they, you. They know that that's a, a, like animals like elephants, ourselves, uh, gorillas, we look in the mirror, we know it's us. Turns out that manta rays know that it's them which is pretty interesting because cookie dough, the chihuahua, did not know herself when she looks in the mirror, <laughs> even though she can make all of you make your cards disappear. Um, so this human nature divide to me is something that I really wanted to explore again with children. And so uh, many of my children's books are on that theme. And as a writer, I'll just say it's been a tremendous joy to be pushed from being an explainer. I used to write nonfiction children's books. I always interview scientists firsthand. That's my approach. And I would always explain all the things they told me. And one thing I've loved about being pushed into picture books is they should be exploratory. So when I have this up here, you know, when you blow a kiss to the world, you may spread 
pollen that will become a flower. Is that what that says? I think, something like that. Um, when I write that, I want to tell you about the palynologist I interviewed who studies how pollen is distributed by people, right? But I think it's more evocative this way. And I have a new book coming out in April. I'm going from here to the American Library Association to do that. And the idea of this book is I meet so many children who are overwhelmed by the things they hear about the environment, just overwhelmed in that whole list of depression and apathy and fear. And I just thought, you know, a huge source of hope for me is my sense that I'm part of this incredible planet that has all of these species that are really resilient. And so this book is about you are just never alone. No matter what you're doing, no matter what, you know, there's, we get to breathe. We get to drink water. We get to do all of these things. Um, and that's what's going on there. Can you see those words? Can you read them? These are just excerpts from that book. This one, um, that one of those uh, conversations that again we'd like to take up afterward is a sense of an embodied sense of hope. And I think that's what I'm trying to get on here. And again, that feeling. So the question I really will probably never fully answer <laughs> is just how can we collectively create this global academic, epidemic of wild creative hope? Because I'm using wild on purpose. I'm very interested in interspecies relationships. I'm using contagious because hope is contagious, as is hopelessness. And I'm using hope because I just think it's something we need so much. And this is a map of human um, airplane traffic. And I just think it's such a powerful map because even if I just talk to everybody I sit beside, <laughs> you know, think how powerful I would be as a disseminator of hope. Right? I could just infect a whole plane. And I will tell you, <laughs> what, one last really funny story was I, I kind of learned a life lesson. Uh, the Smithsonian Institution has created an Earth Optimism. They do now a big international meeting once a year on optimism. And they invited me to their inaugural one. And I was so excited to go. I can't even tell you how excited I was. And I got to the Toronto airport. The meeting was in Washington. I got stuck in the airport for 48 hours. I couldn't get out of the airport. I couldn't. And I just couldn't get over the fact that it was kind of like my birthday, but I couldn't get to the party. You know, I tried to go with a whole hockey team of people, junior A's, but they got flushed out and I couldn't get through immigration. Anyway, I couldn't get there. I never got there. So I just spent my whole 48 hours talking to people about hope in the Toronto airport. And I sometimes wonder, was that a more effective uh, <laughs> thing? Because I was desperately talking to them. <laughs> exactly. So where I'm going to stop now is, um, right here, uh, these are some of the affinity groups that emerged through our conversations over the course of today. And I can't see who was, do you want to explain those? Um, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, what those are and how they work? Yeah, so through a conversation that we've had with Dr. Ellen Kelsey early in our classes, um, many questions, oh gosh. <laughs> Many questions emerged about how to continue this conversation. And so these are some of the takeaways that we came up with. Um, so there are different seating areas available and they have these signs. So if you're interested in continuing this conversation, please go towards that. You can move the signs and find a space that fit works best for you. Up in the sky bridge on the fourth floor. And do you wanna see what else is there? Oh, sure. Well, <laughs> I'm recognizing that some of you have to leave. So um, do we have time for like one or two questions? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So if you have to go because work starts like in three minutes, then please do that subtly. But um, uh, we'll have some time for a uh, couple of questions. And after those questions, Ellen will head over to the, the book signing group. But otherwise, you can go upstairs and do a photo booth and take some photos of things that you think that bring you hope or you want to spread hope. Uh, you want to give a gift of hope, so we're going to do that, and then hashtag ocean optimism and other hashtags that you would like to do. There's a social media area where you can just simply send stories to each other. And then there's also a letter writing section where you can write physical letters with pens and pencils and paper. <laughs> and then write addresses, and there's, a, there's computers and stuff that will help you find uh, addresses, and then uh, you can take your letter off to the nearest box and otherwise there's these affinity groups to be able to continue these conversations up there as well on the sky bridge and food. And we can create other groups and I, and I will just say that 
I think what's so exciting about being in a university is that on the one hand, my agenda is absolutely to spread wild contagious hope. That's, that's going with me forever. Um, and yet, the, the way to do that is, is both to take it upon ourselves to find where we find hope and share it with the people we care about in whatever mechanism we have, and that's why we have all these different vehicles. And at the same time, in an academic setting, to critique these ideas and what parts of them are resonant and where do tensions exist and how do we bring all of that to bear. And that's why it's been so wonderful to do this workshop in this way. And so these kinds of critical questions in the best sense of critical thinking, um, we like those kind of conversations too. So we're both trying to spread hope and we're trying to critique what we mean by that and what, how that all emerges. So that's, that's why the variety of ways of interacting. If there's any quick questions. Do you want me to send this mic up to that person? Yeah, that was the idea of the table. Can you speak loudly? Um, yeah, I was just curious what you think about the differences between manifestation and hope. Um, and if you have any opinion on those two, if they like collide very strongly or if they're a, a little bit more unique in your, in your answer. Can you say a bit more about how you see them? Um, certain times that manifestation like, really is um, a potential and um, he didn't really go into specifics on what those times are, but you know, that was something that uh, definitely stuck with me about that. I really appreciate that and that's a, that's a perfect example of a conversation, right? To have, I would love to have that conversation. And, and I think part of my interest in emerging trends is I think trends are ways of seeing things that are becoming manifest. And what can happen around that, like I, I worked on marine protected areas since I was your age, and very little appeared to be happening for quite a long time. And then suddenly the surge of things, and I think that has to do with the capacity to recognize areas, I think it has to do with all kinds of things. And so in that sense, I think, for me watching as things start to emerge, like this interest around solutions, then that allows a manifestation of maybe solutions for me often engender hope. Um, so is that part of where, we, where I might go with that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Others? Yeah. Pretty simple question. Do you have a favorite animal? Do I have a favorite animal? All, oh, I always say that, all. Oh, I, I no, other than my chihuahua. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I think one of the great pleasures in my life is I, I really, when I come upon very hopeless content, or I, I, I think back to years and years ago, I, I had a job in a prehistoric park, uh, and I really wasn't interested in dinosaurs in any way, shape, or form. And I made myself become interested in them. And then what I realized is, of course, dinosaurs are living animals, and now I'm tremendously interested. And so I think, there's not a single species that I don't think we could find things that are absolutely intriguing about. Yeah. And then they bump up my list. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. How long have you been writing? Yeah. So I, I uh, was writing for Owl Magazine, which some of you might know from Canada. It's like a, can a Canadian version of Ranger Rick. Uh, and I started doing that when I was 18. So I've been writing for a long time. Yeah. Yes. What about anger in all of this? You talked about fear and shame, but I'm curious about anger that I know I feel and I know other people, including young people, feel about the things that we've inherited from the past, um, including pollution and other legacies, um, and that we continue to inherit. Where does anger fit in, and how do we put that together with hope? Yeah, I really appreciate that you asked that. One of the things that you will notice that I did is I didn't talk at all about um, uh, despair really very much. I talked about a gloom and doom narrative. I, I, didn't, talk, I didn't name those things and talk about them. And, there, and that's a conscious choice on my part because I think that those narratives are so dominant and we spend so much time in them that um, I'm trying to push things in a more diverse direction. That being said, I think these conversations are completely intertwined. I think we sit with multiple 
emotions at the same time. And research literature says that for us. And I think that anger is incredibly powerful, especially amongst teens. This teen activism that we're seeing right now is another whole trend of power, and that is driven primarily by anger. So I think it's a really important point. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Have you always had this uh, well contagious hope, or was there a catalyst that moved you from one side to the other? That's a very kind question, too. Um, to, honestly, one thing that did happen to me, I have a, a nephew who I adore. I adore all my nieces and nephews, if they're watching. Um, <laughs> but my nephew once said to me, you know, if everyone's doing all this stuff, has anything gotten better? And I thought to myself, that's such a good question. And why is it so hard for him? He was a young boy at the time. Why can't he have access to whether, how might he answer that question? And so I think, yes, I've always been, I've always been sort of a critical thinker about general slogans. Um, and I absolutely believe in creativity and our capacity to co-create things. And the older I get, the more I see that things I thought could never happen actually can happen, sometimes for the better. Um, but that was a catalyst for me. So I thought, I, and that's what led me to write Not Your Typical Book About the Environment. I thought, I'm going to write at least a book that I could point to and say, take a look at this. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe one last question. Yeah. How do you turn hope into action? Ah, so psychological researcher says that hope is actually an essential precursor of action. That if we really are hopeless, we don't believe anything can happen. And if you don't believe anything can happen, you, you know, that kind of puts you in a certain place. Certainly other things may manifest without you doing anything, but your actual agency is very much diminished. And so I think it's, that's why I'm interested in things like pride or co-creation or a sense that I'm part of something bigger, is that one sense of agency is, I think for a long time when we talk about environmental interventions, it was on the level of individual. You should do this, you should do that, you should do that. And it even gets to ridiculous points where we, we take primary school children and we say, you should save the world, right? I, it's nonsensical. How is, how is, I mean, I'm not saying they're not involved in the world, but to put that on a seven-year-old is, in my opinion, immoral, right? I think what we do know is that when you feel you're part of something that other people care about, you are not alone in your anger your grief, your uh, belief in something really matters, then your agency is enacted. It's, in, it's innervated. And then you have the capacity to, to be part of something. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.